I will confess to you that this has been a difficult week and that what you're getting this morning from me is a Sunday morning special. Uh, I want to thank you for being here. I, this is one of those days when your presence here probably lifts my spirits more than my presence here lifts yours, the beautiful anthems we've had this morning and cheerleaders even. That was a great, great thing for me today. Thank you very much. I invite you to listen to the New Testament reading, which is Mark's version of, of the baptism of Jesus. Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 11, found on page 34 in the New Testament section of your pew Bibles. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the tongue of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. May God richly bless the reading and the hearing of the portions of the word which have been read this morning for our understanding and living. Amen. In this year when we are focusing on what it means to live in the light, coming to the story of the baptism of Jesus provides us some pretty vivid pictures of what it means for light bulbs to come on in a person's life, giving the light of clarity about one's purpose. In only two weeks, we've made the quick move in the church year from the birth of Jesus to the baptism of Jesus some 30 years later. We would love to know a lot more about those 30 years, what daily life might have been like for Jesus, whether there were signs for him about who he was, other than the trip to the temple at the age of 12, or whether he grew up as an ordinary boy, 
apprenticing in his father's carpentry trade and spending his days making and repairing things. But Mark isn't even interested in the birth of Jesus, much less those 30 years. For him, the story begins with Jesus coming to John the Baptist to be baptized. And he tells this story in a very bare bones sort of way. Douglas Hare, in his commentary, describes the importance that Mark places on this event by saying this. There can be no doubt that the baptism actually occurred and that for Jesus it constituted a major turning point. It marked the great divide between his private life as a skilled hand worker in an obscure village and the short but tumultuous public career that was terminated by his execution. It was undoubtedly his call experience. Jesus' call, however, was clearly distinctive. He was called not to be simply another prophet like John the Baptist, but to be God's ultimate representative, the Messiah, God's son. The way Mark describes events, they were experienced personally by Jesus. They were not things that were experienced by other people who were around that day. So Jesus must have shared these experiences with his disciples at a later time in order to help them understand his call to ministry and the beginning of it. William Barclay uses four words in talking about the baptism of Jesus, and I'd like to borrow those this morning as the structure of my comments. He says that the baptism of Jesus is a moment of decision, a moment of identification, a moment of approval, and a moment of equipping. While I'll be talking about these as experiences that Jesus had, I'm sure you'll be able to see some parallels in the events of your own lives as we go along. <clears throat> so first, the baptism of Jesus represents a moment of decision for him. He obviously heard about the ministry of John the Baptist, which was taking place about 50 miles away from Nazareth in an out-of-the-way location along the Jordan River. On foot, 50 miles was quite a trip, but he felt called to leave home and make this trip and experience John's ministry for himself. Though Mark's account is very brief, I feel sure that when he arrived, Jesus spent time listening to John's preaching, talking with other people, observing baptisms being performed, and seeing and hearing the response of people to the ministry of John. And then he made another very significant decision. And that decision was that he would identify with John's ministry and that he would identify with the great mass of people who were coming to express their repentance to God, to be washed clean from their sins, to begin a new life. So here's the second word, identification. By taking their son to the temple years earlier to be circumcised and dedicated, and by taking him annually to the Passover festival in Jerusalem, Mary and Joseph identified with traditional Judaism, and Jesus was clearly brought up in a faithful and observant Jewish home. But now Jesus chooses to identify with a movement that is outside the bounds of traditional temple Judaism and its bureaucracy. You'll remember that Pharisees and Sadducees also came to John from Jerusalem. Matthew says they came to be baptized, but John calls them out as vipers who intend to strike and kill when the time is right. But Jesus identifies with the ministry of John the Baptist and he shows that by submitting to John's baptism himself. And Jesus also identifies with all of those other people who are coming for baptism from John, people who are stepping outside of the comfort zone of traditional boundaries and are opening themselves to God's presence and work in their lives. These are the people among whom the Spirit can move and make a difference. And Jesus identifies with them by being baptized in the same way that they are. 
You know, a common question about this passage is, why did Jesus have to be baptized since he never sinned? Well, baptism for Jesus was an act of identification, an act of submission, which was totally in line with his whole life's ministry. In becoming human, God made flesh, Jesus became fully human, fully obedient and submissive to God his Father, fully subject to rejection, suffering, pain, and death. This is not a sham incarnation. In response to what Jesus does, God then identifies himself with Jesus in a powerful statement of approval. As Jesus comes up out of the waters of baptism, he sees the heavens torn apart and a dove descends and he hears a voice coming out of the sky saying, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Wow, what an experience. What an affirmation of his decision to come to John and be baptized. Remember that Jesus was around 30 years of age at this point. If there had been similar epiphanies in his life before now, he surely would have recounted those to his disciples as well. So I wonder if he struggled at all with his sense of call and his vocation during those 30 years. Other people his age, other men his age, would have been married and had teenagers by now. They were well along in their lives. But now at the age of 30, a light shines clearly for him. A new way forward is revealed and God's approval makes clear that the time has come for a new beginning for Jesus. So this moment of decision which leads Jesus into the wilderness to John the Baptist leads to an act of identification with John's ministry and with those who came to be baptized with Jesus being baptized himself. This led to receiving God's approval and blessing in a very powerful manner. And it also led to a moment of being equipped for the ministry he was about to embark on. That dove which descended upon Jesus was the Holy Spirit, <coughs> which anointed him for ministry and prepared him in every way for what lay ahead. Richard Boyce calls this moment an exorcism in reverse, a point at which Jesus became possessed by the Holy Spirit. To lend credence to that idea is the very next verse, which says immediately the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness for a period of temptation and preparation. Now, that's another story for another day, but what's critical to note is this, if you're equipped with the Holy Spirit, it is also necessary to be trained in the ways to use it, not for your own power and comfort and prestige, but for God's glory alone, even Jesus. After the temptation, the next thing Mark recounts is that John the Baptist was arrested. It's another moment of clarity for Jesus. It's time for him to step up. If what John had started is not nurtured, it can slip away just as quickly. <clears throat> so at this point, Jesus begins his public ministry. It's not going to be just like John's, though. It's not going to be conducted in one place out in the wilderness where people are expected to come to him. It will be conducted all over the place, in towns, in villages, on and by the lake along the roadside, in the countryside. It will not be a baptism of water at all. It will be a baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. It will set people's hearts on fire, not only then, but across the millennia since. And it all started with Jesus making a decision to go check out the ministry of John the Baptist. If I were to tell you what led me into the ministry, it would make very little sense to you. It would include 
clarity that seemed to me to be brought on by a series of assassinations in my childhood, <clears throat> enduring freezing nights in my dormitory at college, and inability to get home during the Arab oil crisis. It would include Watergate and all of its children. It would include relationships with many dedicated Christian people, some of whom encouraged me to give ministry a try. I'm in my 33rd year of pastoring churches, and I have to say that there's a cycle to what Jesus experienced at his baptism. Every so often there comes a time for a major decision, a major identification with something or somebody. Sometimes there comes the sense of divine approval and of being equipped and used for ministry. Sometimes there are dry periods of temptation and testing that have to be endured. I expect that all of you who have been at this Christian life thing for any period of time can affirm that. <clears throat> Jesus only did it for three years before his crucifixion, but it's easy to observe the cycles in his life and ministry as well. But he was faithful, and God saw him through it all. I think about people like Martin Luther, who rediscovered in his teaching the good news of salvation by grace through faith alone and made a decision to identify with the large masses of people who were kept in darkness by the church hierarchy by calling for the church to be reformed. The church called him before the powers that be and demanded that he recant his teachings, but he said to them, here I stand, I can do no other. I think of his namesake, Martin Luther King Jr., who made the decision that the time was right to call America to live out its creed. He identified with all those who had to sit on the back of the bus, who were unjustly put in jail, who did the menial and unappreciated jobs of society like garbage collection, who had to use inferior restrooms and go to separated schools. The response and the results of his identification were beyond anything he could have imagined or controlled or managed. I think about people like you who every day go out, go to school, go to work, participate in society and daily life, constantly have to make decisions about where and with whom to identify how to regard people who look or act or believe differently than you. We have to make decisions about what we're going to base those choices on, what our political party tells us, what Hollywood tells us, what our church tells us, or what Jesus tells us. What would Jesus do is a great question to start with for all of us. <clears throat> The light of clarity is something we all long for. I like the way cartoons represent it by a light bulb going off just above the person's head. Again, I want to remind you that Jesus was around 30 years old when he had this defining experience. Given that, it's unreasonable for us to expect that just by saying a sentence prayer one day, we will bring a light bulb into effect in our lives. We may well not be ready for that kind of clarity yet. We may well not know what to do with it if we got it. But it is important to be ready when God's time does come for that. Watching, waiting, listening, and expecting that moment of clarity. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> As we respond to God's invitation and call in our lives, I invite you to stand and join me in the affirmation of faith, which is the Apostles' Creed, found in the front of your hymn book at the top of page 35. Together let us affirm our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.